I love horror. I love stuff that is scary, creepy, gross, shocking, or just bizarre. Basically, I watched a Rob Zombie movie when I was 13, and that's why I'm like this now. But with as many horror movies as I've watched over the years, a lot, very few of them have been able to just lodge themselves into my brain and just live there. When Tarman tears some dude's shit open, I pop off because I love Tarman and Return of the Living Dead fucking owns, but it can hardly be said that I'll spend the next few days of my life thinking about how deeply affected by a horror film I was. Like the movie itself was cursed and I wasn't supposed to watch it. Some are better at this for sure, but I think video games are more uniquely equipped to leave you with a lasting impression. Thanks to the potential for a heightened sense of IMMERSION! Wait, please, I promise this video is about Bloodborne. I'm not talking about what people usually mean when they describe something as immersive. Like, when a game goes so far in on emulating the real world that you can source a fucking in-game rock to a real-life rock, or programming the horse's fucking horse balls to shrink in the cold, or having to wait in real fucking time for the fucking travel agency to open. God! I think that games with a lot of creative heft being put behind the realism of their world are valuable and have their place, but to me, in an artistic sense, it's so much more impressive when you feel like you're sinking deep into a world that doesn't work like ours. That world's reality is governed by its own distinct laws, and it has its own unique vibe. When a game is really, truly immersive for me, it's like I'm breathing the air of that world, and it's a different kind of air. You can smell it through the screen. But what if that place you were being taken to was horrible? Like, the most horrible place you could even imagine. And it shook you to your core. Like a nightmare you can't wake up from. Enter Bloodborne. I make it no secret that it's my favorite video game of all time. I have it on my clothes, I have it on my streams, I own the card game. Still haven't played it, nobody ever wants to play the Bloodborne card game. And I keep my PS4 plugged in at all times because I know it won't be long before the cravings come back. Hell, I played it about four more times just to record footage for this. I've clicked on countless videos of other people discussing this game, and damn, people really like to talk about it at length. So what could there possibly be left to say about Bloodborne. Well, I think it's really cool. So, uh, I frequently struggle to describe what makes Bloodborne so special. I've played all the Dark Souls games, Sekiro, and even recently Elden Ring. Maybe I should. Here's an idea. <laughs> but I always come back to Bloodborne and how it makes me feel, which of course means nothing. Everyone's favorite game makes them feel strong emotions, but Bloodborne for me excels beyond any other piece of media at emulating one type of mood. Spoiler warning for the whole game. Whatever happens, you may think it all a mere bad dream. With the city of Yarnum ravaged by a plague born of ancient blood found in the catacombs below the city and distributed by its most powerful institution, the Healing Church, the people now cower in their homes while beasts who were once their neighbors roam the streets. The hunters who slay these beasts, inevitably giving into beasthood themselves, consumed by bloodlust. All the while, great beings we cannot hope to understand surround us, but can barely even be bothered to notice we're there. And those who lived in or ruled over this city are all either dead, dying, driven completely mad, or have become something else entirely. Your character, an outsider, has just arrived on the night of the hunt, and things are not getting better for anyone anytime soon. You're given a transfusion of that special Yarnum blood. You wake up in a clinic, and before you know it, you're running into NPCs like a man who is too sick to get out of bed, a stoic hunter who tells you to prepare yourself for the worst, and a scared young girl who asks you to find her parents, one of which is dead, and the other is the first major boss, Father Gascoigne. He saw all over the shop. You'll be one of them sooner or later. You can play his daughter's music box during the fight to remind him of his humanity for a split moment. But eventually, before the fight is over... Oh man, this got 
really intense all of a sudden. In 2015, when this game was released, I put on some random guy's Twitch stream, and this bit with Gascoigne's transformation was the first thing I had ever seen. It was fucking amazing. He doesn't transform until a large chunk of his health is already gone, so this phase of the fight doesn't last too long either way, but it's hard not to feel a genuine sense of shock at what just happened. Plus, it just really tapped into that part of me that grew up watching stuff like Underworld and Van Helsing. The way that your blood-splattered clothes shine in the moonlight is gorgeous, and you will spend much of the game absolutely covered in the stuff. I mean, look at all that blood! Where does it even come from? <sighs> okay. Deep breaths. Shortly after this fight, once you've entered the Cathedral Ward area of Yarnum, you will encounter the undisputed, universally agreed upon, best NPC in the whole game! Yarnum's done for, I tell ya. But if you spot anyone with their wits about them, tell them about this here Erden Chapel. They'll be safe here. The incense wards off the beasts. <laughs> I get the sense that they were deliberately made to be awkward and beast-like in appearance, to arouse suspicion in players who are familiar with the generally untrustworthy nature of some NPCs in previous FromSoft titles. But they're genuinely just a kind person who wants to help, and I love that. The Chapel Dweller is one of the only characters in the game who feels like just a friend. If you take them up on their offer to provide shelter, the NPCs you can send here are the vile blood prostitute Ariana, Jesus Christ! Sister Adela, a prim and proper nun who believes that Yarnum will still be saved by the church, an old lady who doesn't trust outsiders and thinks that hunters are obligated to help them without any thanks, a man who is a dark beast in disguise and will slowly eat everyone in the chapel if you invite him, and this guy, this fucking guy, I hate this guy. He tells you complete lies whenever possible and goes to the opposite place you tell him about. And by the way, that means if you told him about the church and he goes to Yosefka's clinic instead, it turns out she was experimenting on people there, and he gets turned into a fucking alien, you stupid asshole! The old lady loses herself over the course of the night, starts to think you're her son, gives you a little taste from grandma's stash, and eventually wanders out into the streets and gets herself killed. Ariana and Adela are both thankful to you for saving them, and they will each offer you vials of their blood. You've been using vials of blood as the main healing item the entire game thus far, but these special vials you get from NPCs will often come with extra bonuses like quicker stamina recovery. If you continuously take Ariana's blood, Adela will react maturely by actually murdering Ariana. And okay, I guess I shouldn't jump to conclusions. Maybe there was an accident. You know how it is with spaghetti. If you take Adela's blood instead, or just don't invite her to the chapel, Ariana will later become impregnated by a formless great one, give birth in a sewer, and is so horrified by her child that it completely shatters her mind. <laughs> Chapel Dweller expresses remorse after each one of these events, as they are helpless to provide anything but a place away from immediate physical harm. It isn't enough in a place like this. The night churns on, indifferent to their kindness. It's my fault. Oh my! Don't you see that? I think that this style of romanticized melancholy storytelling is so cool. Everyone who contributed to the development of this game did a phenomenal job, and I really feel that it expertly takes advantage of all aspects of the medium to deliver its mood and tone. But there are just a few more key examples I want to touch on here that I think go a long way in really driving home that distinct feeling of like, oh fuck! I don't need to tell you that FromSoft has some of the most talented artists in the world working for them. You know that already if you've even looked in the direction of one of their games, but 
God, I'd be remiss if we didn't explicitly talk about this. Yarnum is a beautifully depicted and frightening place. It's difficult to find a corner of this game's world that doesn't feel like it was given someone's full attention, and it cannot be understated how bleak it all feels. Sickly beasts and mobs of deranged townies on blood-soaked streets, enormous alien beings sprawled across the sides of ornate cathedrals. Whatever the fuck these things are, what's up with these guys? What is that? <laughs> no, no, no. The multiple in-game mechanics that correspond to your character discovering things that were never meant to be seen by human eyes are also really cool and startlingly appropriate. Ignore that. The grotesqueness of what Yarnum has become is beautiful. I spend so much time thinking about the visuals of this game. Even now with the very pleasant on the eyes graphical fidelity of Elden Ring, and trust me, I really dig the whole grand high fantasy look, I still feel like Bloodborne is the most visually inspired and consistently striking to me. I can't look away. I'm straight up transfixed, my dude. As you once did for the vacuous wrong, grant us eyes. In the Hunter's Dream, the hub area of the game that you'll return to many times to upgrade your gear, purchase items, and level up your character, exists two NPCs. One of which being a mysterious and soft-spoken living doll, and the other a kooky old dude who introduces himself as... Gammon. Friend to you, Hunters. He tells you not to think too hard about what's going on, and to just go out and kill a few beasts. It's for your own good. You know, it's just what hunters do. You'll get used to it. As you progress through the game, though, it becomes more clear that German is a prisoner in this place. He's watched as an untold number of hunters just like you have passed through this dream, unable to leave it himself. Somebody, help me. Unshackle me, please. Anybody. I've had enough of this dream. The night blocks all sight. Oh, somebody. Please. It's really upsetting. I feel terrible for this guy. One of the very last encounters of the game is with Garman. He tells you that the night is near its end, and that he will now show you mercy. He would have you forget everything about this place and return to the waking world, no longer connected to the dream. It's implied that he is saving you from his own fate. If you accept, he pops your shit off and you wake up in the real world. But if you refuse him, he will be obligated to take your life by force. He finds your defiance almost funny. The struggle begins, and your opponent is a sad old man at the end of his rope, trapped within a nightmare. What would a boss fight like that sound like? Gehrman's theme is titled The First Hunter, and it is gut-wrenching. You can feel the pain and desperation on the wind. The moon glows bright, and Gehrman does everything in his power to stop you. It hurts, man. If you kill him, congratulations, you're the new Gehrman in town. And even if you access and beat the secret boss after him, the moon presence, your character's fate is that you entirely shed your humanity and become an infant great one. The doll seemingly instinctively picks you up and recognizes you as her good hunter. 
I've heard people say they think this is the good ending? Are you off your fucking gourd? Fuck you! Bloodborne's soundtrack was created by a group of both Japanese and American composers who focused on key words and phrases that were established at the beginning of the game's development, one of them being mortal struggle and Wow, I think they really nailed that vibe. This game's music is oppressive in its atmosphere. If the accompanying track to a major boss in Dark Souls is a choir of warriors heralding your eventual victory through battle, Bloodborne's musical scoring is a sea of tortured souls wailing out to signal the coming of the end. The most fitting example being another one of my personal favorite moments from the Old Hunters DLC. It's a boss who's only ever mentioned by name in the base game of Bloodborne, and when you find the most prolific hunter of the healing church, it's in a massive chamber filled with hundreds of corpses, blood pooling the entire room. Ludwig's body is contorted into an indescribable mass of gruesome flesh and too many legs. It's hideous. The beast charges you, and you are fighting a screaming, frenzied animal. As the fight turns in your favor and its health bar reaches the halfway point, a cutscene interrupts. Ludwig's holy sword falls to the ground beside him. The glow of it draws his gaze. <laughs> ah, you were at my side all along. My true mentor, my guiding moonlight. He stands up straight and brandishes his blade. He sets his eyes upon you. And this moment feels like... no longer hunting a beast. You are dueling a seasoned killer. His swings are trained and focused. Even distorted as he is, Ludwig recalls his vows as a hunter of the church. To him, you are the beast here, and it's his sworn duty to cleanse you from the world. It's so fucking cool. Once the victor is decided, the severed head of this broken hero lies on the ground, still clinging to life. You can speak with him, but it's clear that he's beyond any help. If you're wearing church attire, he mistakes you for one of his own. Have you seen the light? Are my church hunters the honorable Spartans? I hoped they would be. I feel terrible, and I always lie to him. I let him die with his honor intact every time. Ah, good. That is a relief. To know I did not suffer such denigration for nothing. Thank you kindly. Now I may sleep in peace. Even in this darkest of nights, I see the moonlight. Tragic figures like this can be found all over Yarnum, but by the time you've reached the end of the game and the night comes to a close, it seems impossible that anyone could be left alive and unaltered. We are all entangled within a web we cannot even perceive. This place is not just horrible, it is horror, stitched into the very fabric of reality. There is no good ending to any of it. This isn't an age of fire or dark situation. Completely alone on this night of the hunt, the status quo of Bloodborne's world will not change, and you will either be spit out and left to die by it, or set to become a cog in its machine. Cursed Daphines. Their children, too. And their children forever true.
Well, that got a little heavy. Uh, look, this game means a lot to me. A couple years after it came out, I was in a really dark place in my life, and I beat it for the first time. Things were really bad, and I was hardly speaking to anyone or hardly eating. But this game was the one thing keeping me going. I was getting out of bed to play more of it during a time when I sorely needed a reason. Now that I'm saying this all out loud, I guess it's kind of strange that a game I just spent a couple thousand words describing as extremely sad and potentially upsetting helped me get through an already bleak period of my life. But as pessimistic as I might be describing the outlook of this game, I feel seen by it. It's nice to know that someone else out there has been through some very hard times. They probably know what it's like to feel like you're drowning in hopelessness, and maybe they even still feel that way from time to time. I'm really glad they made a game about that instead of going to therapy, because it really resonated with me. I hear a few people bought Elden Ring, so it looks like things turned out pretty okay. I will always dearly love Bloodborne, because in the way that only a dimension of pain and misery filled with unthinkable horrors and entirely contained within a PlayStation 4 can be, Bloodborne is like a friend to me. The kind of friend that makes you sure things are gonna be okay.